Hello and welcome. In this lecture, I want to pull together and wrap up all the work we've been doing on translation. And what I want to add to the conversation is the following. Heretofore, all of our translation examples have been binary relationships, which is fine. We won't extend beyond binary, uh, although we could. But they've been one single relationship in isolation. And that is not necessarily enough to get the big picture about how a, an entire entity relationship diagram turns into a set of relational schema. So, and that's really important. I mean, that's why we're spending the time. So what I want to do with you, do, uh, with you here in the next 10 minutes or so, maybe less, will be to work through a more realistic and uh, ERD-wide example because there's some bits of trickiness. So let's say, and we're just going to go abstract and say X's and Y's because it's real hard to think on the fly of these sorts of realistic examples and I think you can focus on that which we're trying to master more readily by doing this. Okay, and uh, let's put it over here we will say W. Okay, so let's do mapped. Really, uh, map, map translation. Uh, all of these examples will apply irrespective of what technique you are applying. Let's say, and of course we'll just give these alphabetical names instead of semantic names because we're dealing in abstract representations. Let's say for a given instance of a W, there can be multiple instances of an X, but a given instance of an X will only ever have associated with it one instance of a Y. And likewise, given instance of a Z can have multiple X's, but a given instance of an X could only ever have one instance of a Z. And here we have a X, uh, given it's X, multiple instances of Y, given instance of Y, uh, uh, only one. Okay, so what we've done thus far was to say when applying the map translation, when there are one to N um, cardinality relationships, map to N side, right? This is not news. I'm sure you've had that, uh, had an ample opportunity to absorb that. So what we might do is say, well, okay, so here's a one to many relationship, so we'll draw the circle to include the relationship, and like so. Okay, but what the heck about this one to many relationship, and what the heck about this one to many relationship? So, what I want to impress upon you here is that we need to combine everything that we can, and it is more than fine for a given relational schema to wind up having multiple foreign keys. That's common, that's good where it's appropriate, and you would expect that. So we don't look at each individual binary relationship in isolation. We say, okay, we have one to many relationship here, so we will include the WX relationship in the X entity. We have a one to many relationship here, and the N side is the X, so we will include it there as well. And then finally, we have a one-to-many relationship here between X and Y, although one is the one side, not the many side. So we will not, in that case, map the relationship. The relationship will be included here in Y. Okay? And then, of course, we will have a separate W table and a separate Z table. And what that looks like in terms of relational schema, let's do the easiest ones first, which is W and Z. We'll have a W table with W number and whatever other attributes we want to capture about W. We'll have a Z table with, oh, I forgot to underline as primary key, with Z number as a primary key and whatever, whatever other meaningful attributes related to the Z entity. And then we will have the next least complicated situation that we've seen before basically is Y. We will have Y number as the primary key for Y, just by assumption. And because we've mapped this relationship, we will bring X over as a foreign key, and we will say X number 
will be our foreign key. And the reason we're able to do this is because we know for one instance, oops, I erased that Y. For one instance of Y, we know there will only ever be at most one instance of X. So we can put this here, not violate our definition of the relational model or our uh, primary key uniqueness requirement. So we're looking good here. And that's not new, that's, that's something we've seen before. And then finally, we've got x, which is a little more complicated. x has x number uh, by assumption as its primary key. And, well, we forgot y has whatever other attributes y would have associated with it. And x has the foreign key w from this relationship as well as the foreign key z from this relationship. So we have w number as a foreign key, and we have z number. Uh, hang on here, that's not quite right. We have z number also as a foreign key. And so a, a given table can have as many foreign keys relating its foundational information back to the tables in which it, or the entities in which it engages in relationships, uh, it, as many as it takes. In this case, we would have two, and then of course we would have whatever other relational, or, um, uh, meaningful attributes native to X that that we happen to have. But the important thing: two foreign keys, twenty foreign keys, no problem in that. And so when you're assessing these, you don't necessarily assess them in, in isolation. You can draw a circle around as many relationships as are appropriate given the relationships that a given entity participates in. And that will, it's not at all uncommon for that to wind up yielding multiple foreign keys. And we know that W relates back to the W table where it's a primary key, and Z of course relates back to Z where it's a primary key. And so this right here is new. Maybe you'd already gathered this, uh, you know, if you did, good for you. But I know it's something that I've noticed students in the uh, in-class sections of this course have occasionally um, stumbled over. And why, why wouldn't you until you had it pointed out to you? But now you do. And there you have it. So let me know if there's any questions about that. Uh, study hard, and I will see you online.